Welcome to another Farming Smarter Plot Shot. I'm Mike Gretzinger and we are back in the matrix. This is uh, Dr. Randy Kucher from the University of Saskatchewan's Brainchild. And uh, behind me here we have year three of three, or on a three year rotation. So we've uh, seeded strips in one direction the first year and then perpendicular to that in the second year. And now we've filled the entire thing over with Durham. So as precursor crops, just as a reminder, we've got wheat, barley, and durum. We've got canola and corn. We've got hemp and quinoa, and then we've got peas and dry beans. And so in this final year, we'll have a different iteration of all those, uh, those rotations uh, with durum on for the final year. And so the big thing that we're looking at this last year is what does that do to FHB levels? And, and how do those crop rotations affect whether or not we get a lot of FHB in the crop and what that does to the dawn and the mycotoxin further down the road. So we've got a number of assessments. We're just finished collecting all the leaves and doing uh, leaf ratings. You can see this year, because it's been so hot and so dry, even with all the irrigation we've put down, we haven't had a lot of leaf diseases. Last year, these were covered in powdery mildew and septoria, leaf spotting and all sorts of things. This year, just a little bit of spots and, and really nothing that's gonna affect yield in, in any meaningful way. So. Right now, what I'm going to do is kind of start walking through the plots and just doing kind of a general assessment. Uh, normally, we'll, we'll pick a number, 25, 50, or 100 uh, kernels to sample, and then we'll just evaluate each one and see whether or not it has FHB symptoms on it. If it does, we'll give it a rating, uh, usually 7, 14, 33, 50%. Uh, we have a little scale to go by, and then we'll give it an index. So if we have a lot of a lot of uh, heavily infested heads, it'll have a, a higher index value. It, in this case, we're, we're not finding a lot of FHB, and I think all across Western Canada, even the typical hotspots in Manitoba and Saskatchewan this year, all the levels are down, and that's just what happens when you go and try and study a disease like that in, in natural populations. But uh, w what we're gonna do, I'm gonna look through really quick, I'll grab a couple samples, show you what they look like, and then we can go from there. So the most likely chance is, is probably corn and corn. So our cereals are obviously carriers, uh, corn being a cereal. So I'm gonna sneak through here. I don't think it'll take me too long to find any. Um, obviously if I was only sample five, 10, 15, 20 plants, uh, my incidence isn't that high this year, but we will, we will find some pretty quick here. So I'm standing here in a corn, corn, durum rotation plot, and obviously that's a worst case scenario for FHB, um, three carrier crops in a row. I grabbed a couple samples out here walking through. You know, they weren't heavily infected, maybe just uh, a couple kernels, but there's definitely infection here. One of the, the main ways that uh, FHB is spread, it used to be through infected seed, also infected residue, so uh, all, all the spores go down, uh, the infected residue sits in the soil, it overwinters, you plant a crop on it in a subsequent year, and it can get reinfested. That usually happens around flowering timing. That's one of the reasons we try and keep the humidity down around here, which really wasn't too humid this year. We did have quite a few dews in the last couple weeks, but not, uh, not our typical, you know, really high humidity through July period that we've had in the past. So uh, maybe a little lucky for farmers that way, not for us, unfortunately, but uh, this is, uh, you know, evaluating all, all the different combinations here. I can already pick up, you know, whether or not, e even at the lower levels, I can pick up pretty well that uh, some of the, the residues in combination seem to have a lot worse uh, FHB than others. I can walk through some of the plots where there's been two years of uh, a rotation, like a, a pea and a, and a dry bean or whatever it is, and, and not find any of these kernels whatsoever. So uh, it'd be pretty interesting to see what happens. Obviously, there's a couple things to be cautious of when we're looking for FHB. So this is a great time to do it because the, the dough is just start, starting to really form inside. A couple weeks ago, the, the shells were basically empty on each of the kernels. So um, 
This is a really good time to see that bleaching. We tend to really see the little bit of orange pinkish spores right on the outside and that's a, a dead giveaway that we've got fusarium. Uh, we did have some grasshopper infestation here like most of the southern Alberta so we, we sprayed these plots. We didn't want them to inflict any more damage. I have seen a little bit of grasshopper damage right on some of the heads and kernels on the occasional spot so we just make sure we don't confuse that. We're also evaluating for root rots and, and things like that. And this is one where we kind of get to can, tend to get these root rots or take all type rots. And you'll see the, the heads themselves are usually further down because in the canopy, because the plant has already died off from this take all rot. So pay attention that that's not FHB. And then we've also uh, get uh, some kind of like bunts or scab or things like that on the seed sometimes. And, Generally the, the clue for that is there's a lot more brown. I actually don't have one in my hand right now, but there's a, a little brown and sometimes a little outline uh, on, on each of the kernels. And so uh, we don't want to confuse that either. We're really looking for that, that bleaching of the whole kernel, a uh, little white and, and pinkish and orangish coloration in there.